to another session of Science Center. Today's topic is germline therapy, and here with us tonight we have Dr. Minerva McCowart from Gentech Corp, Dr. Ginny McCopper from the Gemini Foundation, and Dr. Hermione McSabowski, Professor of Genetics at Harvard University and author of Transgenic Transformation. <laughs> Dr. McSabowski will be talking about the gene ther germline therapy process and methods currently in use. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Dr. McSabowski, and I will currently be talking to you tonight about the process of germline therapy and the current methods being used. Germline therapy, also known as inherited genetic modifications, is a process of introducing expression of genes within the germline cells and those are the cells that eventually become viable eggs or sperm. Germline therapy produces a permanent correction to genetic defects of both the people receiving the therapy and their future offspring. Unlike that of somatic gene therapy, which only addresses the situation at hand and only with multiple treatments throughout that person's life. Transgenesis is the main process by which exogenous DNA, which is the transgene of interest that's going to be inserted, is introduced into the genetic makeup of the resulting transgenic, in this case, the human um, being. Current transgenesis methods being used in the study of germline therapy are retroviral vectors, microinjection, and the use of knockout genes and or cloning. With the use of re retroviral vectors, an RNA virus is replicated in a cell that integrates with the host cell's chromosome. This is transfected on an eight-cell stage embryo before the gene of interest is inserted. The transvected cells are then extracted from the embryo and implanted into the foster mother. The future offspring are then later tested for the transgene, and the only major downfall to this method is that the retrovirus sequences can disperse throughout the genome, causing multiple problems. Another method is that of the microinjection. This method involves superovulating the donor females through injection of hormones, which basically make her produce multiple follicles that will allow many chances and many opportunities for this procedure. And then you'll mate her and then later sacrifice her. The fertilized eggs are obtained where both male and female pronuclei are visible. The male nucleus is injected with the linear DNA and then 25 to 40 of the transgenic eggs obtained from the foster mother are implanted microsurgically into a foster mother who has already been made pseudo-pregnant by a vasectomized sterile male sperm. PCR is the method that is currently being used to test whether or not this transgene has gone through this person or not. The last major method is that through the use of embryonic stem cells. This is the most this is the most um, useful method currently being used, which directs the transgene to a specific position within the genome. This method is also used to introduce knockout genes, which are genetically engineered genes that have been made inoperative in the particular organism. Then the last one is that the use of cloning through nuclear transfer. This method is obviously a big discussion, and there is further research on that later. May I pitch in now for a minute? Um, it is important to note that right now we cannot do uh, germline transfer on human beings. We just lack the sophisticated technology to do it. Um, however, most of our research is done on plants and animals, and it is quite prolific. It's affected many American lives. If you are a diabetic and you really receive insulin, chances are your insulin came from a transgenetic bacteria. Um, transgenetic Chinese hamsters uh, are producing a hormone that is used to treat anemia. Um, there's the hepatitis B, B vaccine, and uh, we produce human growth hormone, which we previously had to take from cadavers. Um, I haven't even begun to discuss the wide variety of genetically engineered foods, such as corn, tomatoes. 75% of all processed foods in the United States come, contain a genetically modified ingredient. But perhaps the most exciting application of this therapy is its use in determining what genes actually do. Um, there are knockout experiments where we deliberately turn off a gene and make it uh, work or not work properly to determine what the gene does. In other experiments, we add to the gene to make it super functional. Um, 
We also have tracking experiments where we put in some form of marker sequence in order to track function. And the most well known of these being the fluorescent mice that are uh, green glowing, we, where we put jellyfish DNA into them. Well, uh, I've got to say, thanks to other reports by my esteemed colleague, this is all very interesting, but what's really exciting is all the future in this area. I mean, with today's improved DNA sequencing and editing, and I mean, they're discovering new genes every day. You know, it's, it's really incredible. In the future, we might be able to genetically engineer animals so we can use their organs for human transplants. If we could, you know, do the therapy in their gametes, then they would produce more animals, and we really would just have to worry about altering every single one, and then this would eliminate the use of immunosuppressant drugs. Wouldn't that be nice? Yes. We could also use transgenesis techniques for human enhan enhancement. This would involve taking genes from one species and putting them in another. We could get superhuman traits, and it would be super cool. We could also use biotechnology, <coughs> biotechnology in food in order to make healthier, you know, foods that could be good for humans to eat, such as a low cholesterol tomato. <clears throat> Maybe I can even get rid of my cough. I don't know. Really, the sky's the limit with all this research. It's very exciting, and, you know, we can continue to move forward to a new tomorrow. Thank you. Well, thank you. We are out of time now, and next time, join us for our talk about